this presentation is called It Starts With Delicious, and we're really going to go through kind of a starting point of where we start to lose flavor, where we can develop flavors, where we can highlight, and then move that into from a starting point of fundamentals, um, bringing that all the way up to how you start to work with art and take your presentations to a little bit different level. Uh, so I'm really excited about this, and here we go. So. So this is a little introductory video. This is something I made uh, just filming with my GoPro of our experience in Germany on the team. So it's about two minutes long. And uh, this is where I started to get a lot of these ideas of starting with delicious. And I would get questions of um, how are you doing this food at this level and how are you shaping it like this? And what do you need to do to compete on that scale? And for me, it was always about writing the menu first and making the most delicious food you possibly can then whether it's a hot food category how do you fit that into your time frame how do you elevate the presentation mm. So what is delicious? And again, that's where it starts. It starts with delicious and asking yourself that question. I need to write a menu for an event. I need to write uh, a dish. I'm doing a competition. What is the most delicious thing I can possibly present at any given time? And let's start by defining what is delicious. Well, it's an adjective, highly pleasing to the senses, especially to taste or smell. A delicious dinner, a delicious aroma. So highly pleasing to the senses. What kind of things do we associate with delicious? Well, we have emotions, memories, full body sensations. So you eat, uh, some people ask me all the time, what's your, your favorite thing to eat? What's the best thing you can cook? And I always tell them chicken wings because I've never walked away from a plate of chicken wings where I was disappointed. Uh, you get, you have the crisp, you have spicy, you have buttery fat, you have a great balance. It's something that's comforting. It reminds me of football games and growing up. So for me, when people talk about delicious, I, I immediately associate with chicken wings. That's my, that's my go-to. Um, delicious can be a sense of soothing. You eat something and you don't, you're not worrying about anything else. Again, with those chicken wings, or you're having a great steak. It's seasoned properly. You have those chemical balances in your mouth that just makes you feel right there in the moment. Nothing else matters, work, family, no matter what it is, right there in the moment you were able to capture that with some kind of soothing feeling. Um, memories, again, whether it's 
uh, something of a childhood memory, a great experience you had, another great dish that you had, maybe some kind of travel, anything that you can eat, and it can generate these kind of thoughts and provoke these different things, to me, that's delicious. Uh, creating a wow factor. When you eat something, say, wow, that's good. It's probably delicious. Um, satisfaction. How many times have you walked out of a, a restaurant and said, eh, that was okay? Probably a lot, especially in our profession. We're kind of a hard crowd to please. So if you can get that satisfaction, you're, you're spending your money that you worked all these hours for, whatever pr uh, profession that you're in, you're spending that money, you're investing that in something, and what you get back, are you satisfied or are you not? So balancing flavors. If we look at this wheel, everything contrasts. So if you have something spicy, just like we talked about with those chicken wings, on the bottom you have cool. So with your chicken wings, you always serve ranch or blue cheese dressing. You have uh, carrots or celery. Spicy, cool. Rich and fatty right underneath spicy. Then you go into something lean. If the dish is too heavy, you leave feeling you leave feeling upset. Oh, I probably shouldn't have ate that. That was way too much. If you have something that's lean, something that's bright to, to complement that fat, it's a nice well balance. We keep going around uh, cold and frozen um, with warm and hot. Great contrast there. Uh, sweet with sour and tart. All of these balancing of flavors, they create, if you only have one of these, you had uh, some sour pickles. Well, if you just did vinegar uh, and salt and water, it would be very, very tart. It wouldn't be as exciting. If you add a little bit of sugar in there, some, in any kind of sweetness, some honey, uh, agave nectar, again, starts to generate. I remember this hot summer day. We were eating these pickles. You're sweating. It cools you down. It's refreshing. But if you just had sour and tart, it would make you upset a little bit because um, you don't have that full roundness. So let's start, where do we lose flavor? And as we're going through these, I want you to think about things that you do every day in the kitchen and where can we start to capture these flavors? Let's even talk about something so simple as, as a basic fond. You've roasted your bones in the oven, uh, you're making stock or a nice sauce. You roast the bones, you have your tomato, your pinsage, all of your vegetables, and you dump all that in. Now you take that sheet tray and it goes back to the dish machine you lose all that valuable flavor. And a lot of us are shaking our head, that's very common knowledge. Some people go, may be going, oh yeah, I do, what do I do with that? You can pop that tray back in the oven, take a little wine, you can use water, wine, some kind of liquid, deglaze the pan, scrape it down with a wooden spoon, and all of that is gonna go back into your sauce or your stock. Uh, that's something that you can't buy, that fond. You can find similar things in the form of MSG or like caramels and when you start to look at chemically processed stuff, but those fonds are your foundation. If you throw that in the garbage, you're missing an opportunity for flavor and it's probably not going to be as delicious as you thought. Here's a couple of things I've listed up here. Sourcing for me is one of the biggest. It's one of the toughest, but it's one of the most common and easiest to attract to. Locality or the best products? Well, if you have the opportunity, work with your local farmers, your local growers, because most of the time, if you can get those local products, they're gonna be some of the best products. But the locality, if you're using pork, if you're getting your pigs in from a commercially processed plant that's just been fed grains and fattened up to be the size, with anything, with chicken, with pork, with beef, it looks like that product, it feels like that product, but it doesn't have the same marbling, it doesn't have the same movement, why is dark meat better than white meat? Some people may argue. For me, it's all about the dark meat. Those muscles are worked so much harder. Those muscles that are worked harder build up more lactic acid, and when you cook them down, you get more flavor. They're more worked. They're gamier. They're, they're delicious. You're going to hear me say that a million times today, so if you get sick of it, that is the whole point of today, is kind of achieving, uh, achieving delicious. So the locality aspect is amazing. Um, if you can, start your own garden. Even if it's something so simple as, as little herbs that you can use in the dining room, grow them yourself. They're going to taste so, so much better than if you're in New York, the stuff that was grown in a greenhouse in California, boxed up, put on a plane, shipped to Ohio, put on another truck, went over to upstate New York, into that truck, moved over there. So finally, these greens are seven days old by the time you even get your hands on them. So if you can source locally, awesome. And then the best. 
sure, there's the luxury. So we're not talking about the luxury side of, oh, well, if I have caviar and sea urchin flown in from Tokyo and Skiji Market, um, sure, that, that's the pinnacle. But there's also our reality where we can't fly in fresh sea urchin from Skiji Market every day for our, for our guests. So what is the best possible product you can get your hands on? And if it is, if the best possible product you can get your hands on is a cryovac bag of uh, pre-peeled carrots with uh, some gas that was pumped in them, then, then that's the situation that you're in. But if you can get carrots that were plucked out of the ground um, and delivered to you with the dirt on them and you still have to wash them off, there's, you can see that huge comparison and con contrast of the flavors. Some of the best carrots I've ever had are ones that I grew in my garden and part of that was just, part of it was the emotional side of growing them myself and watching them take six months to finally come up and then pluck them out. But when you tasted them, they had all the, all the nutrients from the soil. Spices, think about your spice cabinet right now or at work, you have, uh, maybe you have some jars of spices, maybe you're getting in some nice little ones. One, look at the dates on those. First thing is, when were those even packed? They may have sat in a warehouse for months, maybe a year before they even got to your kitchen. And then have they been there for a week, a month, a year in your kitchen? How can you spice those up, pardon the pun? Um, take them and just simply toast them in the pan, roast them in the oven, get those oils to come out of these spices and refresh them a lot of times and it's one of those things that we kind of overlook every day well your, your spice order comes in great we ordered this this and this but you don't check the date like you would a piece of meat on the spices right like oh are these are these were these packed last week i don't want them send them back your guys are gonna look at you like you're crazy if you send the spices back like these weren't packed this morning i need i need fresh spices and then continuing the conversation about what goes in the garbage what are you throwing out every day and as chefs, it's our responsibility to reduce waste, educate, and obviously we wanna feed people and come up with the best possible products. So not only what is going in the garbage that could be used, let's say composting versus uh, just throwing it out. Can you start a compost pile? Can you work with a local agency that comes and picks up your, your leftover food to compost? More soil for your farmers, so they have richer soil, and that again comes back to you with great vegetables. But Something like Parmesan rinds. Well, you cut the ends off the Parmesan right in the garbage. Well, if you take those, put them in a cheesecloth because they'll, they will stick to the bottom and burn, but you gently simmer them on the stove for a couple hours. Or if you're making a tomato sauce, throw them in there in the cheesecloth. You're going to get all that beautiful lactic acid, all that beautiful Parmesan flavor, and instead it would have just gone in the garbage. So kind of everything you touch, everything before you, it hits the garbage now, what else could I do with this? Coffee grounds. What do you do with your coffee grounds? Servers take them, dump them out. You make your coffee in the morning. What else can you do with those coffee grounds? Put them in the garden. It's an awesome idea. I do the same thing at work. You can take those coffee grounds. So they still have flavor, right? So if you're making, um, you've already extracted them once, but now maybe you want to roast something inside of coffee. Uh, or you want to make, uh, okay, beets. So you take your beets, a little olive oil, salt, pepper, pack them in those coffee grounds and roast them. You'll get a really nice coffee infused flavor. You want to do um, coffee, cardamom, carrots. Mix it all together, roast it in the oven. You'll get really nice coffee infusion that would have gone in the garbage. If you take those coffee grounds and you mix them with your toasted black pepper and you make a nice black pepper crust for your steaks. So all these things, again, would have gone in the garbage. Tomatoes. There's a million things you can do with tomatoes, whether the skins or I mean, you have that little piece, those two ends. So you, you concasse, you take the core out, and you cut out all the guts in the middle. Well, what do you do with the guts? Go in the garbage, right? So if you can take those, um, you can puree them up, put them over cheesecloth, and just literally, that's it, a little salt, puree them up, put them over cheesecloth, and all that liquid will come out, and you have this beautiful tomato water. It's a light clear if you wanted to do some kind of clarification to make it a little more refined, go for it. Um, but now you have nice clear tomato juice that you can make a little shooter, do a, a play on a BLT where you have a tomato shooter with caramelized bacon and uh, wrapped in lettuce. Could be kind of interesting. But really looking at all those different things. What are some things, if anyone's thinking of some, what's something you see that goes in the garbage every day? Nice, a lot of stuff, right? So one thing we're gonna touch on it later, but 
Think of how much um, fruit maybe ends up in the garbage. It's going to start to spoil. You don't get to use it in time. We'll, we'll talk about perishable, like basically fruits, and veg, uh, fruits, vegetables, and herbs. So when these things are going to rot in our, where we're not going to get to them, what do you do? They compost or they go in the garbage. So can you take these pineapples that we're going to rot, cut them up thin, dehydrate them in your dehydrator in your combi oven, and then sell them for $5 a little bag of healthy snacks of pineapple that would have gone in the garbage. So little ways that you can now take things that would have gone in the garbage. Or you take that pineapple, same thing, you dehydrate it, you grind it into powder. Now on your shelf in a little um, airtight container, you have pineapple powder. So you want to make pineapple sorbet. Instead of ordering in new pineapples, you have those ones right there. So you take that, add it to your cream. So where can we add flavor? So it all starts with getting the best ingredients, right? And that's kind of our foundation. Uh, if you don't start with a great product, it's very hard to enhance it along the way. We never want to take product that's, that's already gone bad and try and salvage it. It's, it's a way to, to prevent that spoilage. So where can we add, add flavor? Let's talk about fermenting. Does anyone do uh, any kind of fermenting right now? Awesome, couple hands. There's a great book by Sandor Katz. It's called The Art of Fermenting. A great read. It's a great, it's not a read. It's like a, a dictionary like this. Uh, it's a good resource. Something so simple. Let's talk about sauerkraut. When you take cabbage and you eat it by itself or you saute it, it's good. You add a little bit of salt. Um, that salt pulls out all the water from the cabbage and you let it sit at room temperature, then you can transfer it into the refrigerator, it starts to develop um, lactic acid. And that lactic acid gives you that great, when you think of yogurt, it gives you that great tang, uh, it gives you different levels. So when you eat it, it's not just uh, like a bitter green. You have some kind of funk, you have some bitter, you have some salinity, you're getting a little bit of tart from that lactic acid, again, acid, uh, tart environment. So just taking something and fermenting it, you can use miso, pack things in miso paste, and they'll start to cure and ferment itself. But fermentation, again, with that lactic acid bacteria, is a great way to take products and, and just bring them to a new level. I messed around. We did a, a vegetarian class at Electrolux, and I took barley, and I just soaked it in water. Soaked the barley in the water overnight, and then I strained off the barley, and then I just let that water sit in the fridge for a week. And that water was like, it was like tangy, it was weedy, and it was really, really interesting. And I, I didn't really know, I mean, you think barley and grains are basically making beer in a, in a very novice level. Um, but it, you, could, you could let those barley soak in there and begin to sprout. Um, and then that liquid though, that liquid starts the fermentation process and it's just really, really great. So if you're making this barley dish now, and you have uh, some butter, some shallots, garlic, you have toasted off your barley a little bit, Toasting, again, back to that toasting. Toast your grains, toast your farro. Toast it off, then you have your, your chicken stock and it cooks down. Now at the end, you're taking that fermented barley water and just hit it with a little bit of that at the end. It's gonna give you this really nice note that if you've eaten, uh, you've eaten kimchi or any kind of fermented product, it hits you kinda in the top back of your mouth. You start to get that. So now you're getting the fattiness on the front of the tongue. It's kinda coating the top of your mouth and you're getting that tang up in the back. And then ho hopefully you have a little lemon juice, some more acid, which is gonna make your mouth water. And now you're getting this entire experience in your mouth while you're, and you're not thinking about these things. You're just eating some barley at dinner. You know, we're, we're the masterminds that are behind this project um, to give our customer the best possible bowl of creamed barley or, or whatever we're doing with that. But when they're, they're out to dinner, having drinks with their friends, whatever the occasion, maybe it's a celebration, everybody goes out to eat for different reasons, whether it's nourishment, entertainment. But when they can eat that and turn to their friend and go, wow, that is awesome, or we need to come back here. Just that little thing of using, using a little um, fermented barley water just to, to entice it. One thing I do with my grits is I take the grits and cover them with water and I let them sit overnight outside of room temperature. And then the next day I take that same water. So I take everything, dump it into the pot and I cook it down. That corn, the water, or you have the yeast in there and all the strands that start to eat off the sugars in the corn and it starts to ferment lactic acid. Now when you're cooking, cooking this, again, it's just like this whole sensation. You have the sweetness from the corn, you have your, your salt, a little bit of salt in there. Um, the acid part from that fermentation. 
Fermentation is awesome, and I could talk all day about different fermentation, but I mean, who here likes beer? So we all love fermentation, right? Sprouting grains. This is a really simple one, but really gets overlooked a lot of times. So you can take your grains. They have to be living. Sometimes the chemically processed grains, they'll, they'll pull off some of the husk and, and important things to keep it alive. But if you simply take, you have quinoa uh, on your menu right now. Take the quinoa and cover it with water and just let it sit for two days. Right, you soak it overnight, strain off the water, and then fill it back up. So it's a two-day process, but they grow these little tails on them and you spark the nutritional value. Um, so all these enzymes that were asleep, and by the time those grains can actually process through our body, we're, when we're eating that grain, we're getting two different experiences just from that little piece of quinoa. We're getting that little crunch, we're getting that little burst of water uh, from the little tail, but it just tastes better because it has those active enzymes inside of it, and it's better for you. Yeast from brewery for breads. This was a really cool one. So uh, I live right next to a brewery, and I was talking to the head brewer over there and watching him do his, his magic. And the first thing he did when he, when he took the keg is he dumped out all this liquid. And I was like, what is that? Is this foaming? It looked like you were at the ocean. He's like, oh, it's just yeast. I'm like, well, is it, is it dead? What's, I mean, why are you just dumping it out? He said, well, all the yeast in there, it eats the sugars from the malt and the barley, converts those sugars into alcohol, and then it runs out of food, basically, so it goes to sleep and falls down to the bottom. So the first thing you do is you have this, this sludge of like beer yeast that just goes down the drain. So I asked him, I was like, can I take some of it? And I took it and I fed it a spoonful of honey and I put two jars next to each other. Spoonful of honey. This thing rose like 10 times and the other one didn't do anything. So it was exactly that. It ran out of simple sugars to feed on. So now... I'm taking that leftover yeast, instead of buying in commercial yeast or any kind of dry pack yeast or fresh yeast, I now take it from the brewery. So it's cool because you can have a story, memories, we're trying to generate memories with Delicious. You're getting more flavor. They've already created lacto acid fermentation with, that, with making their beer. So now you have some yeast. You're not going to get crazy amounts of flavor. This isn't going to, you're not going to add this yeast in there and they're going to go, what have you done to the bread? It's, wow. But it's that little change that um, is going to take it to another level. And again, what would have gone down the drain, but we're using it back into that product. So you'd use it just like any other yeast. If you're using 20 grams of commercial yeast, you would take 20, maybe 40 grams. You're not going to hurt anything. Um, and you just take this sludge, throw it in there, add a little bit of honey, kind of bring it back to life, and then just throw it in your dough. And it's a really cool story to tie in with a local brewery. And you can put it on the menu as, like when we did it, it was wooden, wooden robot uh, country bread and people loved it. Cooking with better tasting fats. Okay, this one, this one is a real, real personal favorite of mine. So cooking with, with better tasting fats. Let's look at where can we save fats. Bacon, we all cook bacon every single morning. So all that fat, you can't cook everything in bacon, but hopefully you're saving that fat and using it for something. And you could advertise it. I think that's delicious. Cooking, cooking uh, breakfast potatoes in the bacon fat doing some kind, of, some kind of hash, basting. If you're cooking pork chops, what better? Why would you cook it in processed canola oil or clarified butter instead of cooking it in bacon fat? You know how delicious those things are gonna taste? And you're gonna get that little bit of sugar that's in, your, in most bacon cures. That little bit of sugar is still gonna be in the fat and it's gonna help keep caramelizing even, even farther. So you're gonna get this really nice smoky flavor that's added to these pork chops all just by something you would have thrown out. Again, we're reducing food cost, but instead of throwing that out, you're searing in those meats. Let's talk about lamb fat. For me, lamb fat is the most delicious thing on the planet. Lamb fat, to me, just gives you this whole nother flavor and universe. So just take, if you need to render out any fat, you can do it two ways. You can roast the fat, which gives you a really, really nice caramelized flavor. Literally take the fat, roast it in the oven, 325, It'll get nice and dark brown, strain off all the, all the other particles, and you have nice roasted lamb fat to use for anything. Um, when the lamb, you have this beautiful rack of lamb that's about to go out, brush it with some lamb fat, little smoked sea salt over the top, send it out. Uh, it's just that one more kick of something that you would have lost because you cooked it in a processed uh, canola flour oil or olive oil that has a low smoke point so it actually burns and turns the carcinogens. I would take those, you cover them in water, and you just boil them. 
and it, it reduces down, put a little more water over it, and you're trying to extract all that fat. Eventually the water evaporates, and now you're just left with a beautiful pool of rendered fat that you can use for anything. So lamb, like lamb fat potatoes, like lamb fat french fries are the greatest thing in the world. Smoking properly. So smoking, grilling, roasting. We know there's these basic techniques of, I mean, who doesn't love grilling? Grilling is probably one of the easiest, grilling and smoking are probably one of the easiest ways to capture that memory, and that essence. You're getting smell when it comes to the table. You're getting that smell, you're getting texture from some kind of crust, whether it's the bark of the smoked meat, the caramelization, the mired reaction. You're getting, that's kind of an easy one to do something delicious, grilled or smoked. But let's, let's break down smoking for a second. If you do a, a tabletop smoker, anyone in here that's used a tabletop smoker, you see that when it's going, it's this really dark yellow, gray, it kind of smells a little sulfuric. It's not really the, the sexiest thing when you eat it. It's got a little bit of that bitter notes. Wood basically starts around 212 degrees when you're, when you're smoldering it, and it starts to release the moisture. So when you start the smoking process, it kind of smells like steaming wood. It smells like kind of a forest after it just rained. 212, that's the temperature that wood's getting to. Once that wood gets to about 390, it starts to produce what's called carbonyls. These carbonyls have preservative factors, so acetic acid, formic acid, and formaldehyde, but they also have your coloring agents. So just like a tea bag, you drop the tea bag in the water and you have instant color, but you have to let it steep for five minutes to get all that flavor. The same thing kind of happens in this wood. When your wood gets to 540 degrees, so now you have this nice color, you have the preservative agents, but if you stay in that temperature, which you're getting on a tabletop smoker, because you're not getting that wood to smolder at these higher temperatures, it's a very bitter, acrid smoke. It smells like rotten eggs, and it's not delicious. It's an important part for it, but it's not delicious. So we need that wood to burn between 570 and 900, and 720 being kind of that sweet spot. When you get into that level, you're producing what's called phenols. And these phenols are water-soluble molecules that when you walk past a, a barbecue place and you breathe it in and your mouth starts to water, these malatols hit your tongue and your mouth starts to water. All of those are produced at that temperature. So you'll hear barbecue guys talk about blue smoke. And it's a really nice uh, white, light blue smoke because of how hot it's burning. It's crucial that you're burning in that temperature. That way you're getting that sweet smoke, you're getting all those malatol flavors. If you're not at that high temperature and you're below that, and we're just talking about the wood smoldering point, below, you're getting, again, that very acrid, not so pleasing smoke. Once you go above 900, you just start to produce carcinogens. And it's just, it's all downhill from there and you're just tasting ash at that point. So when we take it back to basic fundamentals, that's crucial. We're all scientists, whether we like it or not. Everything we do is a chemical reaction. When you just kind of look at that, again, assessing everything that's happening, it's really easy to stand up here and say, execute the fundamentals and you'll cook good food. Learn the basics. And that's, that's, that's here. That's the 10,000 foot level. But really analyze what you're doing every day and how can you, are you taking the right step to really make it delicious? Uh, where can we highlight flavor? We're taking that product, so beef jerky. Um, some kind of beef, and we're literally just dehydrating it overnight, and we're concentrating those flavors. Vegetables, any kind of pineapple chips, dehydrating, you're going to concentrate all those flavors. And reducing in layers. So let's talk about a basic sauce, some kind of uh, beef jus. If you take, it on, you take the sauce, you put it on the stove or your stock, and you put it, a gallon on, you just start, you boil it away. Well... You're boiling all those beautiful aromas out into the air, and you're taking what's here and bringing it down. Great, you're concentrating those flavors. But imagine, and you would think it'd be faster. Well, I'm just gonna throw it all in there and it's gonna be faster. It's actually faster if you do it in layers. And it's more beneficial doing it in layers for this reason. Let's say you have, um, this is your, your stock right here. So here is, is the highest you could possibly caramelize before burning, and then here is zero reduction or caramelization. So this stock is going, 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 and it comes down to that nice syrup, right, that dry pan. So it comes down to that syrup. Well, now it's about to burn. So we add in more liquid, and we're allowed to now take this one. This keeps going and pushing it further. 
and then you keep adding on. So we add in our another liquid, and that one keeps going down. It's down to sec, so it's about to burn. We add in more. So this right here, this initial stock, would have stopped right here at, at that flavor building and that caramelization. So the more layers you can build in that reduction, the more you're pushing those levels of caramelization. If you think of a good wine, you can kind of tilt the glass, and you can see, just by looking at it, you can see if it was... If it has a lot of age to it, you can see different levels of coloring. It's kind of that same principle, those different levels of caramelization. So if you eat this sauce, it's going to give you all those different reactions we spoke about earlier versus just, oh, it tastes like, it tastes like salty chicken broth at this point or something that's reduced. When you just bring this down, you have to reduce it so far to get those flavors that you end up with such a small yield. And this time you'll, you'll bring it down so far that you'll end up getting a lot of gelatin content. So when you eat, when you try the sauce or your stock, it starts to coat your whole mouth. And when you eat it, you kind of go, because you're looking for some kind of acid. You're looking for something to trigger all those senses. So if you can do that in layers, you're going to get a really great flavor and you're not going to develop too much of that gelatin um, but by the time you reach that flavor, which is awesome. Um, bringing an idea to life. Now we've kind of talked about some of the how are we going to get to delicious? And we're going to start thinking about all these different processes of making the most delicious food. And then how do you bring that to, to life or to the competition arena, to your menu? This is something I do when I was on the team. I would just do this on PowerPoint and use the different shapes and say, okay, I want this here. I want that's going to be octopus or this is going to be the lamb and it's going to be a little artichoke on the bottom. This is a great way to just get your ideas on paper if you're not good at sketching. And then you can really kind of look at that. Say, well, do these flavors really make sense? If we just look at, we just look at the lamb piece, you have a kind of lean piece of lamb. It was wrapped in pounded out fat with herbs, so now you had a fatty component. You had a crisp being the potato chip, something that was spicy, gave it a little bit of heat. Uh, the Thai chili, you had the artichoke, which was very rich. And then you had a little bit of lamb jus in there. So you had something fatty. You had something that was a little brighter, crisp, soft. So just in that, this was actually a finger food. So it was about this big. Uh, it was really, really tiny. But when you eat that, you, you hit all those sensations. And it gave a really well-balanced thing. Just by putting your ideas like this on paper, you can say, OK, do I have all those components? Can I check all those things off? So this was a roasted street corn a play on street corn that I did for, a, for an event. You can see some nice roasted corn, some great color, and you just have all your flavors there. You have some of the fatty cheese, you have some of the, the crunch from the tortilla, it was just ground up a little, some like kind of bitter astringency from the cilantro, some freshness, and some uh, acidified creme fraiche for that tart. So you have all those different components. Now, when you take it and you transform it a little bit, you create a totally different experience for your diners. So before seeing that spoon, you say, all right, it's all there. Really nice roasted component, great charred flavor. We have the fatty, we have the textures, we have all these things. So now how do you, how do you elevate your, your level of presentation? So this was uh, a silicone mold that was made. And we cooked down, I'm going to show you a video of this whole process, but we cooked down the corn. So how do you cook? corn. You get butter, milk, you boil it, all these, talk, these uh, beautiful aromas go up in the air and then you take it and now you, you're walking around with corn on a stick that has all this stuff. You're eating it. It gets all over you so this, this can trigger you back to a memory. Maybe you're at a carnival, something like that. But now you're walking around all day. You have, uh, you have corn pieces in your teeth and you're constantly trying to grab them. Corn has very high fiber that's not soluble to our bodies. So I think you can figure out the rest. Um, so when you cook out the corn and you cook it down um, with a little bit of cream, this milk, uh, shallots, garlic, butter, you're doing the same exact process of this beautiful street corn. Now it's palatable to our bodies. We can absorb all of the nutritional values that corn has to offer for us. Um, and it's kind of cool too, at least I think it is. So taking delicious to art. We, we touched on a lot of these where, again, first thing, start with delicious. You can't do this. You can't present this to somebody 
and they say, oh, wow, cool, this looks like something from the MoMA. This is awesome. And then you, you go in and go, oh, it tastes like watery corn or like I, yellow water. I don't know, this is really strange. That corn has to be the most delicious thing on that plate, especially if you're going to challenge it um, to be something different for people. Again, the more soluble fiber we talked about, consistency. So this is a silicone mold I developed with Chicago School of Mold Making. It went from uh, using it on the team in one aspect to transforming into my own silicone mine, which is a really cool experience in itself. But something like this, now you have consistency. So let's just talk about roasted, this roasted corn again. We'll stick on that. You're serving it for a buffet, a party, whatever it is. And these ones have been sitting in the, corn, in the, the liquid now for 20 minutes, an hour, while you're putting all these other ones out. Or, okay, those ones sat out too long. Let's throw them in the garbage. Let's get these next ones. These ones, you freeze them and pop them out, and it's this puree, and you can set them on, on the plate, so it's a party of 200. Every single plate is going to have that corn in the exact same spot, and it's all going to be delicious. So it's kind of one piece of mind that you don't have to worry about, uh, which, is, which is really cool. Better guest experience. We started with delicious. How can you improve the guest experience? Maybe you just start with that piece of delicious, whatever it is. It's crispy chicken skin. I mean, the best part of fried chicken for me is the skin. I rip off the skin. I don't even eat it together. I just rip off the skin and crunch on that. And then I have juicy chicken to eat afterwards. I'm like, okay. Uh, but that fried chicken skin is the best part. So there's guys that are doing just serving fried chicken skin as a, as a snack now. Why not? Why waste all your money on the rest of the part? Just serve them what they want and charge them the same money. You can improve the guest experience in some way. If it's hinders the guest experience. So that's where to say maybe this food doesn't need to be touched. It doesn't need to be shaped or molded or anything really done to it. If it's delicious, it's delicious. If you can improve the guest experience, go for it. And then draw inspirations from other professions. So this came, I did a, a competition and I created, it was a piece about this big and I called it the corn nibble. So it was the same concept, but it looked like you carved off a little piece of corn and uh, it was sitting on the plate. And the first time I, I presented that at the competition, they were kind of like, oh, it, it doesn't really look, um, did you like cook it in milk? Is it, uh, are there like herbs? Is it flavored? I was like, well, can you just taste it? They're like, yeah, I mean, yeah, taste it, right? I guess, you know, that'll tell me. And, and when their spoon went through it, he was like, whoa, that's cool. And I kind of lit up because I was like going, I, I was like swinging for, for the fences and, uh, and he was really excited about it. And this was really a uh, really great chef that I respect a lot. He was excited about that, so I, I stayed excited about it and kept developing. So now I did the competition, and that was my, my like, cool aspect on the plate, something that, that gave it a little bit of an edge. Uh, and it was good. And they, all the judges were kind of like, how did you do that? How did you do this thing? And I'm like, oh, it's just a piece of like, silicone that, that we made. And then talking with Michael Joy, who is one of the masterminds behind this mold school, we were sitting down, we were talking. He's like, well, can you use corn as a texture? So here you have it as a transformation piece, but can you use it as a texture? So if you, and we were looking at pendants and all these different art books, and he's like, if you can take corn as a texture and then present it on the plate some way so people know it's been manipulated, so they don't have that trickery part, but they're kind of like, how did you get that? I've never seen anything like that before. And we said, well, what if it's just a ring and it's a corn? And we start sketching it out. He's like, that's awesome. Let's try it. And uh, I've been really, really, really happy with that so far. Um, so that's a cool, a cool piece.
So the, the stabilizers I use are, I use uh, carrageenan. Carrageenan versus gelatin gives you a, uh, a vegetarian form of stabilizing uh, versus the gelatin, which is of course from either pork or cow. But when you freeze these, these molds and then pop them out and thaw, um, carrageenan holds onto those water molecules um, so it doesn't leach out like gelatin would. This is a little, yeah. So I use a blend between iota and kappa carrageenan, um, which allows you to heat it up, and, and I can send that recipe. Um, if, you, if you purchase a mold, it comes with a recipe and like videos and all that stuff, but I'm happy to share that as well. Uh, but with that, you're allowed to bring it, you can bring it to room temp, you can serve it cold, so a great like salad component with some blue crab and asparagus, or you can take it um, I've messed around putting that on the plate with a steak and then so Electrolux were a combi oven manufacturer as well as a million other things but you can actually do plated banquets with that on there so you have your, your roasted carrots your, your dauphinois potato that corn piece and uh, let's say pork belly or steak and it'll actually re-therm all of your plates so now all you're doing is a little sauce and go so the day of the party instead of 100 or 20 people putting out a party for a thousand you have two guys just sauce and go and you can get some cool components like that on there uh, this was another piece that we did for the team this was foie gras and raspberry so foie gras we're starting with some of the best ingredients get a don't get b or c and then you you want to pair so you have something that's fatty we need something that's a little bit of tart whether you're using huckleberry jam or raspberry so this was just uh, raspberries and a little sugar cooked down pureed and strained and made that as a little glaze so you can see the the inside we made a foie gras mousse and piped it in a mold, froze it, popped it out, and then had a bigger mold made, filled that with the, the raspberry jelly, and then just popped it right in there. So here is just a simple way to take something that you would normally do. You would have hot foie gras with some apples. You would have some kind of fruit, some sweetness, a little bit of tart, uh, or you're doing a cold concept where you're always adding a little bit of salt, some kind of tart that again gets your mouth watering so that fat doesn't coat your whole palate. So now you have a little one bite piece. Um, you have two concepts. One that was the finger food where you just pop that in your mouth and you have those different flavors. You had the crisp, the herb crisp on the bottom so you got a little bit of texture. You had the fatty, you had the acidic, really well rounded. On the top you had a little uh, soft brioche with the toasted crust so a little bit of crunch, um, texture, little salad greens, some things to just light it up. So just different ways to think from how do we start with the basics and then keep climbing that ladder. Organic versus controlled. This one, when we're talking about plating, something like this, it, I had somebody comment on this one time and they said, it looks like somebody just picked up the earth and put it on my plate and I don't know if I love that or I, or I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I said, well, well what makes you hate it? I said, well, it's I want to say it's messy, but it's not. It's very, it's very controlled. I said, okay, so what don't you like about it? I said, I don't know, it's just, I, I can't put my finger on it, but I, I think I like it, but something tells me not to like it. And that's where you have, you have a beautiful quenelle. So that takes technique to get a nice quenelle. And that's kind of your, if we talk about molded piece, that's your, your nice molded piece. You have the little macaroon, a beautiful perfection piece. And then the meringues that are a little more organic, they kind of go, they give you some different height elements, another crunch element. And then you have the, the cardamom crumble with some kumquats. So you, had, you have tart, you have all your components there. You have crisp, you have creamy, you have um, tart, sweet, fresh, it's all there. It's not just organic in a sense of let's just throw it on the plate or do this crazy saucing technique if it doesn't have a purpose. So if I am doing these, 20 dots that go in ascending order because uh, I want it to look cool on Instagram. Is it adding to the dish? Does, does that component make me say this was delicious or did you say I needed more sauce? Did the sauce dry out by the time it got to the customer? So you had little nice sauce up here and then on the bottom it was all dried out. Sauce is a huge component for the plate. It's probably one of the most important parts on a plate. So if you look at that organic versus controlled, every move that you make um, and some of these modern platings and, and whatnot, is it contributing to delicious? And it starts with delicious 
and then you can start to add the art concept into it. But if any of those steps along the way jeopardize you saying that was the best dish I've ever had, then don't do it because you're jeopardizing that experience to say what is delicious. And the last part, uh, we'll do some Q&A, but um, I hope everyone would follow me on Instagram or subscribe to YouTube. Uh, I have a website that I just updated. I'm constantly posting pictures, recipes, videos, things like that. Um, so if you want to stay in touch, it's an easy way to get a hold of me on any of those platforms. And uh, just cool to see people's feedback as well when I post something like, hey, this looks terrible, or hey, this is a great idea. On Instagram, it's just Corey B. Siegel, just my name. And uh, I think everything's kind of the same website's Corey B. Siegel.